It's going to be in our head all night. Hello, I'm Allison Kluger, and I'm a lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Business, and I am joined by my co-lecturer, Tyra Banks. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we are here for our third year teaching this really special class that we call Project U, have creating and extending your personal brand. We have 25 amazing students who have worked for close to two weeks to come tonight and present their personal brand pitch. And throughout this course for two weeks, they have been assessing, differentiating, learning how to broadcast, and also learning how to create a narrative of what their personal brand should be. We also throw in a little bit of visual branding so that their words can match the look. What do you think? What do you think about the first week and a half that we've had? I, I every year I'm always like, oh my gosh, I can't believe the the journey that our students have been on and where they've started and where they are today. And even just walking backstage and talking to them, like they seem like energetically nervous, not nervously nervous, which is a good thing. Yeah, and I can't wait to see. I can't wait either. And what's funny, Tyra, is the first day when we tell them they're going to do this as one of their final projects, the look on their face. They're like, it's I'm like not going to go on live Dear TV. Cotton headlights. <laughs> and we both say to them, you are going to be ready, and you're going to do great. And I have so much faith in this group of students. Mm -hmm. They are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they're just the loveliest group of students, mm -hmm. aren't they? With beautiful stories, yeah. beautiful stories of sharing, vulnerability, strength, triumph. We're going to see it all. And so our goal is that for them, for them is to come out and in a minute and a half or so tell us kind of who they are, what they believe in, what they want to do, what their passion is, and what differentiates them. And they're each going to have a different story to share with us. And that's how we're going to spend the evening. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to welcome our first student. Let's welcome Victoria. Victoria. <laughs> Growing up in Chicago as an only child with two working parents, I found myself at a lot of adult events. In these moments, my pen and my paper, they became my allies and my consistent friends. Through drawing, I could imagine I was anywhere. I could create new worlds and explore my creativity. Through drawing, I learned the power of coloring outside of the lines. I grew up and I worked in the art world, working with incredible artists who were doing their moonshot projects. A neon Stonehenge in the Nevada desert, the first artwork sent into outer space, these projects were incredible, but I also realized that the art world is really small. And for a lot of people, it's intimidating, it's scary. Yet color, texture, shape, these things are things that we all understand, that we all, you, that can inspire all of us. They are things that really give us emotion. And so if you think about color, think about the last sunset you saw as a painting, as something with orange and yellow and pink across the sky. Or thinking about texture. When was the last time you were on a trampoline and the cords stretched across your feet and supported you before you jumped? Or even the shape of a building casting a shadow across you. All of these things cause feelings that we all know and live. Art is a part of our everyday. I inspire people to see it. You know what I love about Victoria? Since she came into our class, she looks like an artist. She's full of color and she dresses the part, so her visual branding is right on point. Right on point. I love the sound of Victoria's voice. I can remember Victoria's first submission video yep. that she did for our class, and I found that she had great content yep. but was so soft. Tonight, oh I know. my gosh. I know. She shined, she was powerful, she took us on this story journey, and now I'm very intimidated by art, but I'm a little bit more interested in it because of what she said. Yeah, and I feel like I want to notice things more. Yeah. She did a great job. Yeah. 
All right, let's welcome our second student. Welcome, David. There was a commotion going on downstairs outside of my apartment uh, one evening. And I remember walking up to the window, looking out to see what was happening. And when I looked out, I saw a bullet fly right past my face, just a couple feet away. I stepped back, terrified, but sadly, not very surprised. You see, this kind of violence was far too common in my neighborhood. And sometimes I would think back to the days my mom and I were homeless and, and question if we weren't better off then. So fast forward to today, and I'm just a couple months away from graduating with a Harvard MD and a Stanford MBA. Nothing short of a miracle. But what sets me apart? I'm no better than any of the other kids on my block. I was just lucky to find people that cared. And that's a recurring theme you'll find with stories like mine. We just needed care. And I believe that our healthcare system has an important role to play in providing this care. Violence is a major public health issue uh, and is the leading cause of death in young Americans. It's actually the number one cause in young black Americans specifically. So, as a medical student at Harvard, I worked on this issue through, the, uh, through a hospital-based violence prevention program where we brought members of the community into the hospital to work with patients, counsel them, and provide them with a series of wraparound services meant to address the underlying cause of their violent injuries. Now, as a business student at Stanford, I'm pushing this model even further and working on developing a hospital-centered uh, approach that recruits the biggest violence offenders as our strongest advocates against it through our support of their created and designed grassroots efforts uh, to try and prevent the violence that occurs in their communities. And in doing this, we hope to encourage our patients and their communities to dream beyond the block. Thank you. Wow. Okay, was that like a professional speaker? Did I just... Was that David? <laughs> no, I mean, first of all, look at how he was dressed. <laughs> yeah. When he comes in, he always looks good in our class, but yeah. that suit, that power suit he it was wearing... next level. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I, I, I feel like I was just at a TED Talk. <laughs> that, I thought the same thing. <laughs> there was so much power and yes. passion behind what David just said, and we know his story. Mm -hmm. What makes it so strong is his desire for change comes from a very real place in him. Yes from growing up, from witnessing things, and so you know he's going to make this change mm -hmm. because he's so authentic mm -hmm. and because he, he comes from a place kind of, of pain and reality yeah. and wants to make this world a better place. And talk about art. Victoria talked about art and seeing the world in pictures, and David was painting the picture of his life and where he came from. He did it so beautifully, I was there. Yeah. I was right next to him when that bullet was flying. That's how much he painted it in a way where I felt like. I was there. I felt too. And honestly, from beginning of class to right now, he just hit it out of the park. I agree. His use of gestures. I agree. How he, it was just fantastic. So proud of him. Okay, we're going to move on. Let's welcome Allison. It all started on my gap year. I wanted to be close to a boyfriend who was at Georgetown, so I started working on Capitol Hill. But as boyfriends do, they come and go. <laughs> but my love for politics has taken, it grew into a passion that has taken me from the O'Reilly Factor to Snapchat and to Venture Capital. Let's be real, the selfie generation really does not care about the Nevada caucus when it really should. It's a major deciding point when candidates must drop out of the race. When I was at Snapchat, I created a GOP slot machine for a Las Vegas themed story for the primary. It helped simplify and humanize a complex process so that millennials could be engaged in a national conversation. And that conversation is what I'm all about. 
Some people inherit blonde hair or blue eyes. I inherited a speech impediment. I rolled my R's. And just like my idol, Barbara Walters. This obstacle has plagued me. I've been teased by classmates and now Twitter trolls. But I have diligently worked to minimize this obstacle so that my voice will never be silenced. And with this voice, I will continue to be a storyteller and a content innovator. While the ending of my story is yet to be written, I know it will be very exciting as it unfolds. Wow. Very nice. That was terrific. You know, she took my breath away. Yeah. What I love is her energy and her passion, and she's a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love her honesty because whether she has a speech impediment or not, she owns it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it can't hurt her because mm -hmm. she is just so smart and talented yeah. and knows what she wants to do. It actually, to me, is a differentiator yeah. as it is for Barbara Walters. To her, I listen to her and I, I want to hear her because I'm almost attracted to the sound of that yeah. R and I'm like almost gunning for another R. I'm like, let me hear that. <laughs> I think these are the things that do differentiate us and we can take these things that are seen as impediments and actually cast it as a strength. And I think she did that tonight. I think you're right. And you're the one who always says it's be flossom. Like figure out what that, not even a flaw, but something that makes you a little bit different yeah. or quirky. And it's awesome. And it is awesome. Mm -hmm. Great job. We're going to go on now to Edward. Hi, I'm Edward. Soon after I began my investment banking career, I became an angel investor. I met these two great entrepreneurs, but they were suffering so much because they just didn't know how to run a company. I helped them, and this is how my journey started. I failed a lot. I failed on my startup number one, and I also failed on my startup number two. I was devastated, but I didn't give up. Finally, I saw a feeble light coming out of the darkness. Recently, I helped a startup raise capital, build teams, and implement sales strategies. We were very successful. The company grew from a small shop of four people to a very successful company now hiring more than 30 people. I'm proud that I didn't give up, and we made a great company. Looking back, I failed a lot, and I learned a lot from the failures. Now, after finishing up my business school degree, I would like to use my experience to coach and advise startups. I'm the Silicon Valley guy, and I can help you. Let me help you drive your dream. Thank you. Nice job. Very nice That's job. A, he looks amazing. Yeah, he does. You know, we talked a, about that. He has a European, he spent a lot of time in Europe and has a lot of these cool suits that he was a little nervous about pulling out in Silicon Valley. And I'm like, no, again, it's a differentiator. Pull yeah. those cool suits out of that closet. Yeah. And you know, I've heard him tell the story mm -hmm. for the last week and a half. This was the best yeah. he's done mm -hmm. by far. You know, he's all about learning, and I hate the word failure. We've talked about yes. this. It's a big word in this town, though. It's a good word in, in this it town. Is. <laughs> and to me, failure is just not trying. But he, you know, he's got a competitive edge by having gone through startups. Mm -hmm. He's the best person to help counsel other people mm -hmm. who are entrepreneurs and who are starting things up. It's so true because he can tell them what to do and what not to do. Exactly. <laughs> that was great. Let's welcome Nancy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nancy, and I love to live life out loud. From the necklaces I love to rock, to the melanin I proudly wear on my skin, color and vibrancy is such a huge part of who I am. But it hasn't always been that way. I was born with a disability in my arm and my spinal cord called Klemke's palsy. Before I even knew my name, doctors put limits on what I could achieve when they told my parents I could never live independently. But I refused to believe that. 
and I rebelled. I saw how vibrant I could be, and I grew a passion for helping other people see their own vibrancy through photography. Photography has shown me that I'm so much bigger than this body, and it's allowed me to connect with people in deep and intimate ways. I built my company, Okos & Co, to share the stories of women of color. It's been my absolute honor to share their vibrancy with the world. And it's my big, hairy, scary dream to take this company from being about photography to a lifestyle brand. Think cookware and interior design, but designed with the needs and wants of women in color in mind. I want to help other women expose their true color in every aspect of their life. Oh my God, that was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying like not to scream, yell, cry all at the you're same time. You're teary right now. I know. Oh, you're like the mom at the assembly <laughs> going like this for your baby. That's how I feel. Oh. I loved everything about it. Yeah. You know, there's so much joy in Nancy. Mm -hmm. I loved her outfit. Yep. You know, she's the embodiment. What's that word, anamonopoeia, where you sound uh -huh. like you look? Or she's like, pow, with pow. her outfit. <laughs> and, you know, her story is so beautiful, but mm -hmm. she's all about empowerment. Yes, and very clear what she's doing and what she wants to do. And it's yeah. also, from a business perspective, there's white space there. Yeah. You know, there's some white space of, like, this kind of Martha Stewart for black women type of yeah. thing. I'm like, wow, I want those pots and pans and whatever else she's making. Yeah. I want to bring color into my life. Yeah. Like, it's, you can see the vibrancy in everything she touches and yeah. the passion. Yeah. Got me smiling. All it right. got you crying. It did. <laughs> I'm a little bit plumped. <laughs> that was wonderful. Okay, let's welcome Agneta. Hi, I'm Magneta Venkatraman. I'll never forget the moment in 2013 when I walked into a brothel. There were sheets everywhere, it was dark, and I was surprised to see little girls' headbands, little girls' toys, and I was like, what is this? I didn't realize that girls were being trafficked in my own city, in my own backyard. Something wasn't right, I couldn't comprehend it, and my world came crashing that day. I went home and furiously started searching on my computer. What is happening? Why are kids being sold for sex? I realized that there are over 30 million people in the world who are being trafficked right now. Men, women, and children. And slavery was never really abolished. I'm Ignetta, and I'm committed to ending human trafficking. In India, there are over 16 million women who are trafficked right now, who are not literate and who are poor. And I want to end human trafficking by ensuring that they enter the workforce by giving them work opportunities. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Such a beautiful message in mm -hmm. a beautiful package. Mm -hmm. What I think about Agneta is there's, there's a softness and also a fierceness mm -hmm. all together. I love that she came out in a sari. Oh my God, super powerful. You know? Super powerful. Because you, uh, you feel the history mm -hmm. and the authenticity mm -hmm. about her. And her story gave me chills. Yeah. Yeah, I love that her story involved her seeing something and saying this is not right and I'm going to do something about it. And she's dedicating her life to this. Yeah. You know? And it's, it's super duper powerful. And I, I had no idea she was going to come out in the beautiful traditional Indian sari. Oh my God. I so, like, that was strong. Yeah, and, and it's saying something, it's like national pride, you know, it's saying that, you know, I love my people, I love my heritage, yes. and I love these little girls, and I'm going to make sure that they're okay. And you just touched on something, I think that what I felt was a lot of credibility with her, mm -hmm. with, this, with the statistics as well, yes. and mm -hmm. the story. Mm -hmm. I trust she's going to get something done. Yep. I can, that's her brand. Okay, let us welcome Matt. When I was 10 years old, I hopped in the back of the family station wagon and my parents looked back at me. They were very concerned. Apparently, I hadn't been yelling enough at the other children to pass me the ball. Most of the game, I didn't even look like I knew where anything was going on or was like I was even paying attention. 
I mean, we saw you walking. <laughs> the horror. Do you need some help? I mean, your first game, it's, it's only a week away. Ten-year-old me coolly looked back at the front of the car. Mom, Dad, I don't need any help. I don't need to yell at the kids. Everyone always knows exactly where I am. I got this, so don't worry about next week. By Christmas, my school was league champions. I was team captain and had been named MVP, having scored in every game, sometimes five times. Now, 20 years and two torn Achilles tendons later, I don't play soccer anymore. But that 10-year-old MVP, still there. It's who I am. I think strategically. I connect and communicate fully. And I score a ton of goals. My name is Matt Dugan. I whisper boldly. And the results speak for themselves. Yes, you do whisper boldly. Wow. Love it. Wow. Wonderful. What a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. I was just hanging on every word. You know, Matt's had such an interesting time in our class because I tease him, I go, you're so stealth. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't, he wasn't sure what the brand was, and yet his brand is so clear. Mm -hmm. He's a fixer, he goes in, he has confidence, he knows exactly what he's mm -hmm. going to do, he doesn't care what anyone says, mm -hmm. and what he says, I got this. Yeah. What could be stronger? Mm -hmm. I got this. And you know, he seems like that person that when all hell is breaking loose and you're just so stressed and you're trying to figure out what to do with your business, he's like, bring that in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that. And um, I loved how he looked too. Yeah. Wow, that was a really great group of first students. We're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, we're gonna have six more students for you. So <laughs> stay tuned to Project U. Are you a woman that's looking for natural looking makeup that's good for your skin? If you are, then chances are that you're a Harvey girl. Harvey Helms Beauty is hypoallergenic, fragrance free, paraben free and cruelty free. It's for all women everywhere. It's a diverse shade range and skincare, color cosmetics that make you look beautiful. You look in the mirror, you'll see yourself only a little bit better version of it. Project U would like to thank Roxanne DeBlau for contributing to this program. As a personal stylist, Roxanne's passion starts with the person, identifying their voice, style, and approach to the world. From this foundation, Roxanne helps create their visual brand. As a fashion consultant, she builds upon her extensive experience in fashion, retail management, buying, brand building, and sales to provide insights to entrepreneurs. Project U would like to thank Steph Woods Design for their creative visual direction and support. Here's the secret. Your brand is not about you. It's also about your customer. Good branding is eye-catching. Great branding is strategic. Get clear on your brand and what your dream customer needs to see to pick you over everyone else. Steph Woods, strategic design for passionate entrepreneurs. Hello, welcome back. I'm Allison Kluger. And I'm Tyra Banks. And we're here to present a special show tonight, which is based on our course at Stanford Graduate School of Business called Project U, How to Create and Extend Your Personal Brand. This is, how many years is it now, Tyra? This is our third year. Yay! <laughs> third year doing this. We, are, we have 25 amazing students. This is one of their final projects. Mm -hmm. After close to two weeks, they have been practicing what their personal brand pitch is which is basically figuring out how to tell somebody what they stand for, um, what they want to do with their life, what their differentiating factor is. And then we throw in a little bit of visual branding so that their message kind of matches what they're signaling with their look. And we've already seen the first batch. What'd you think? Oh, super impressed, super proud. Me too. Yeah. 
So let's welcome our second batch of students and let's welcome Maria. I spent most of my early teenage years writing bad poetry. I'd spend my summers crammed in a van with my five brothers driving down the roads of New Zealand, my home country, and I'd look out the window at the mountains and think deep thoughts and write them down as awkward, cliched, terrible poems. And every Christmas I'd print these poems out and I'd force my family to read them as their Christmas present. <laughs> And perhaps inspired by this Christmas present, one year, my 11-year-old brother handed me a piece of paper. And on it was a poem. It was the first poem he'd ever written. But unlike my poems, it was amazing. And over the next few years, the poetry just poured out of him. And he recently published his third poetry book. And what's especially amazing about this is that my brother was born with a learning difference that makes it very hard for him to speak and process language. He has a grammar that is entirely his own. I would give him feedback on his poems and I'd say, bro, you gotta put a full stop there and that needs an apostrophe and that is not a word. But over time I came to realize that because he had started with no language, he had to create a language that was entirely his own. One in five children has a learning or developmental difference like my brother. And I wonder what treasures are stored up in those minds. And I wonder if when we look at these children, we sometimes focus on what's missing. There's no comma there. We need an apostrophe there. That word doesn't exist. And we miss the poetry. I want to help kids with learning differences to build confidence in their way of seeing the world so that they can show us a whole new way of seeing the world. And I'd love to speak to anyone who shares that mission, because if thinking differently was not just tolerated, but celebrated, I wonder where that would take us. Oh <gasps> my gosh. I think I need tissue. Oh my gosh. That was unbelievable. Yeah. In the most fantastic way. Oh yeah. I'm so moved. <laughs> I, she's going to do great things, but mm -hmm. the way she told her story mm -hmm. was so beautiful. And we know the journey of her getting to telling the story this way. And we gave her some feedback, what, was it a couple days ago, yesterday? Yeah. She took the feedback and ran with it and flipped it and like went bam. And, and she right? kept this quiet. Like we yeah. had no idea what she was going to yeah. come out with. This was unbelievably this is, fantastic. This was fantastic. Her brand is so apparent yeah. what she's going to do, mm -hmm. but her, her origin story is so powerful. Mm -hmm that only she can have it. Yeah. And it comes from such a place of truth. Mm -hmm. Such a place of truth. And she created a hero tonight in her brother. Oh my yeah. God, it was fantastic. And she looked gorgeous. Yeah, she did. I wanted that shirt, <laughs> but that we'll talk about later. <laughs> okay, I, I'm still, whew. Let's welcome Emily. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Booth and I am always thinking about confidence. My confidence, your confidence, and the confidence of women everywhere. When I was becoming an adult, I had this vision of what a successful woman should be, what she should look like. And to me, confidence equaled perfection. I was fixated on this ideal image of success and I started to lose who I was and the things that made me special. I was so obsessed with being perfect that I used an eating disorder as a coping mechanism to control situations in which I felt like I wasn't perfect. And the more that I tried to control my insecurities, the more unconfident I became. But overcoming this battle has provided the most powerful internal mirror. I now have peace and clarity about my appearance and my personality and my strengths. And to be totally honest with everyone, I still have to maintain my confidence every day, but I am so comfortable with who I am. I'm comfortable with my sarcastic sense of humor. I think I'm hilarious. I'm comfortable with how obnoxious I can be when a Colorado football team wins. And I am comfortable with my five foot four curvy, beautiful body. 
I learned from my own self-doubt how quickly confidence can be constrained, and I wonder how many other women are letting their insecurities get in the way of their goals. I wanna combine my passion for confidence in women with my business mindset to create a lifestyle brand, one that empowers women to break down those barriers. Specifically, I wanna create products that women can connect with to be their best, most ideal selves. I have a secret for you all. Confidence is contagious, and my mission is to spread it. <laughs> I love those. And motions. She's a pro, isn't yeah. she? Uh huh. I loved everything about it. First of all, she embodied confidence. Mm -hmm. Look at her. That ass biker jacket. Yeah, but that be leather jacket. beautiful blue dress. Mm -hmm. Her energy was fantastic. Mm -hmm. She's so inspirational. Mm -hmm. And you look at her and you're like, everything about her yes. is confident and beautiful. And yet she shares the pain. Mm -hmm. And she's, she, you feel like, you know, everybody has something. Yeah. It's a human personal brand. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's, it perfect imperfection, yeah, yeah, which is like speaks to so many women, almost every single woman on earth. And that's what it is. She's so relatable yep. and empowering at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's a great job. <laughs> Let's welcome Jim. My name is Jim Yu and I choose to serve. Growing up, I used to think that leaders were powerful individuals on the world stage, and they were remembered for their accomplishments. Well, I've grown up now, and I've realized that's not the kind of leader I want to be. I don't care if anybody knows my name. I don't care if anybody remembers me, but I do care about creating great people. I realized this when I was in high school. Back then, my most cherished possession was my Army Cadet uniform. I worshipped it. I remember spending hours every week polishing my boots and ironing my tunic. The sheer act of putting it on was transformative. I looked like those senior cadets I looked up to. I felt like a superhero. Those were the three happiest years of my life. And then it all changed. It was my first time leading a group of cadets, and we were late for an assignment. And as a result, we were doing push-ups in the snow. Now, push-ups were nothing new. It builds discipline, right? This time was different. For the first time, I heard a cadet cry. And to my disappointment, those senior cadets that I had so looked up to, instead of supporting this cadet, began to laugh at him, kick ice in his face. Something felt wrong inside of me. I felt disgusted. I was no longer proud of this uniform that I was wearing. Leaders should serve to protect and build those who follow, not laugh and kick ice in their face. I stood up, grabbed the cadet's arm, and took him to safety. And following that incident, I de dedicated the rest of my cadet career to changing the way my beloved corps looked at leadership. I've carried that lesson with me since, and every morning I wake up excited. Not because I want to build great things or great companies, but, be but to build great people. I am a leader and I choose to serve. Oh my God. TED Talk? TED Talk. <laughs> and I have a son, and I'm just thinking, God, if my son could be any portion of who he is, right? Yeah. Just that, that is beautiful. The message is so beautiful and profound, mm -hmm. but how he delivered it, oh. you know, there is, there's such truth in what he said, mm -hmm. but I was hanging on every word. He is a master communicator. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is that for his brand, he is going to be able to influence oh, yeah. a lot of people in this world. Scores of people. Yeah. Millions of and people. He's going to use this power for good. Yeah. Because he's so trustworthy, mm -hmm. he's credible, mm -hmm. he's powerful, and he says it quietly with strength. Mm -hmm. And he, and when he's speaking, he almost 
speaks in the story about the cadets and the negativity that was happen happening, almost like sense memory, like he was taken back to that. It's almost like he started to shake, his voice, you know, there was, did, did you feel yeah, that? Like yeah. he was back there was, in it was that genuine. snow. It was happening as he was talking about it. That's a gift in speaking and being able to do that and recall that from an emotional standpoint. Yeah. So I, I loved well it. Done. Let's move on to Ellen. Hi, my name is Ellen. When I was young, I was told I couldn't be a model because I wasn't pretty enough. I started to believe that I weighed too much and that my face was not beautiful enough. I have suffered the consequences of not being considered beautiful many times. I still remember standing in the canteen line when a guy I didn't know walked up to me and told me I was ugly. He walked back to his friends who were all laughing as well. It affected me deeply. As a teenager, I had an eating disorder and I also had jaw surgery to make myself look prettier. Up to this day, when I look at magazines or romantic movies, I don't recognize a single lead woman who represents the way I look. But then I remember going to museums and seeing statues of women with curves and asymmetric faces. When I looked at them, I thought, that's me. And for a brief moment, I felt seen because I could recognize myself in something beautiful. I believe we need to move towards a world that doesn't promote one look above another and we can all feel worthy. We don't accept sexism, we don't accept racism, so why would we accept beautyism? We need more women with bodies and faces of all shapes and sizes in our media. Let's redefine beauty. Thank you. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm gonna let you start because <laughs> she is preaching to the choir. She, yeah, she's everything that I stand for. And it's, it's uh, to me, it's almost like, she's like the, the politician version. You know, to me, I felt like she was on a stage, like delivering an address, almost like a public service announcement or this like kind of commencement about beauty to so many different people that could be so influenced by what she's saying. And she's, she's right, it's why I wake up every single day. She was so powerful, and all I could think is how beautiful she was. Mm -hmm. There was so much beauty to what she said. Yeah. There was so much emotion, but there was so much fire, fire and strength in her. To make change, you gotta be pissed off. Yeah, and she's she pissed. had the perfect balance. Yeah, that's the kind of people I want on my team. I, I don't blame you, <laughs> snap her up. She was fantastic, I loved it. Okay, let's move on. Still need some tissues. Sarab, welcome. It's 2016 and I'm with Google managing large partnerships for them. Life is really good. I'm happy. I enjoy my work. I'm happy with where I'm going. Then one day we go on this offsite in a remote part of India. As we are walking down the trail, there's a village, small village which comes up to our left. Some activity catches the corner of my eye. I look around and I see a small bunch of kids gathered around one book near a doorway. The room is dark and there's sunlight streaming in through the door. The reason they are there around that door is that's the only part of the room that has light. Something I'll never forget is how joyful these kids were. They were excited. They were living in that moment and grabbing the opportunity in front of them. That changed my perspective about my life and my opportunities. I'm working on a startup now, which creates data science and technology and makes it accessible to small enterprises. Our goal is to make technology easy to use. Our goal is to make it for everyone. I want to create opportunities for others. But one thing I never want to forget is the joy of those kids. I want to live my life in that wonder of those kids in that moment. Nice. Lovely. Lovely. 
You know what's interesting about Rob's narrative is that he took an emotion and a value yeah. in his, which is wonder and happiness, mm -hmm. and that's his brand. Mm -hmm. And so whatever he wants to do in life, it's going to be really engineered by that quest. Mm -hmm. And so who wouldn't want someone like that? Yeah, it's a beautiful brand filter, a beautiful personal brand filter to have. And I thought he was a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. He looked great. I thought so too. Yeah, I love the plaid shirt. Mm -hmm. um, but again, his ability to tell the story in a very genuine and real feeling mm -hmm. um, made it even more powerful. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting, his take on the story, because the obvious thing would be like, oh my God, they only have this little bit of light. Yeah. Oh my God, they only have this one book. Yes. Oh my God. But he told us that, and so we know that that is not fair. However, he chose to focus on the wonder and the joy, which made his story so much more interesting and not predictable. It was differentiated. Mm -hmm. It was differentiated. Great point. Mm -hmm. Well, we are up to our second break. We're going to take a little short break, come back with six more students. Stay tuned for more Project U. Our full-service salon offers precision haircuts, extraordinary colors, and excellent service. But more importantly, we offer a quiet respite to your busy day. A relaxing place you can meet with friends who just happen to be highly experienced stylists and create a unique look that fits your own personal style. Our stylists and colorists have years of advanced training and work confidently with all types of hair textures. We work closely together and continually find inspiration in current styles and trends. Ultimately, our goal is for you to leave Monica Foster Salon feeling your absolute best and to empower you to continue feeling that way every day in between. Monica Foster Salon, Beyond Hair. Pamela Donahue has been a personal shopper and wardrobe stylist for more than 20 years. She loves helping her clients to look and feel incredible. With the highest level of customer service, Pamela works with her clients to understand their needs and lifestyle. She uses this information to develop a customized plan to ensure fabulous results. Welcome back. I'm Allison Kluger. I'm a lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Business. And look who I'm with! Tyra Banks! Yay! Another lecturer. I, this is my co-lecturer and co-creator of Project U, Creating and Extending Your Personal Brand. And this is Tyra's and my third, third year. year. <laughs> and um, this is one of our final pro projects for our course. 25 students in our class come here and they present their personal brand pitch, where they tell us who they are, what they believe in, what differentiates them, what they stand for, what they're putting out in the world. And they're doing an amazing they're job. They're doing such an amazing job. And they've got Allison crying. And they've got me <laughs> smiling so hard that when I smile really hard and get excited, the back of my head hurts a little bit. It's like a good pain. So we're both like. We are, we're, we're feeling we're all these feeling emotions. This. Exactly. We're with our students every step of the way, and it's been such a treat. And we're really proud of them. For the first week and a half, they've really been building to this moment and telling their stories. So let's get right at it. We'll yeah. welcome our third group of students. Let's welcome Sophia. <laughs> Naomi Campbell, Cindy Crawford, Giselle Bonchen. Successful supermodels with worldwide reputation. Growing up in Israel, there has never been a Bedouin fashion model. Modeling was against the honor code in my culture. At the age of 14, I became the first ever Israeli Bedouin fashion model, despite receiving death threats from family members because I believed that every woman has the right to choose the path, the path she wants to pursue, with no constraints. At 18, after a year-long struggle, I overturned the Israeli Defense Forces policy pertaining to minority service and became the first Arab in Israeli history to enroll in the military R&D research and, develop, and development program. At 19, 
I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I was devastated and I felt so helpless. But I was thinking about all the challenges that I had overcome in my life. And I chose to live my life to the fullest because I power through everything. My special strength in life has always been that if I can visualize my success, I succeed. I believe in the power of choice and I choose to overcome. When I have a vision, I drive the world forward. I don't hear impossible and I make the hard things happen. Adversity is not an obstacle for me, it's a driver. And today, as an ex-model, ex-engineer, product manager, I strive to refashion the tech industry, bringing pioneering and innovative products to life, driving the world forward, remembering that everything is possible and to always power through. Okay, where's the ballot box? Because I'm voting for her. I know she's not running for office, but... I'd vote for her for right? anything. <laughs> that was so powerful and beautiful. And again, I want to cry. Um, how much did she put in that, but so concisely? Yes. You know, and the history, you know, it's almost like she's overcome so much. So much. And has not led to fun. I mean, I don't have to say what she's been through, but all I could think is like, wow, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. And I want to be on her side. Yeah. She's that person where you, she's been told no, 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 and she says, oh no, watch me. Yes. You know, like she's almost attracted to the no, so she can prove you wrong. Yeah, and yeah. In, in the framework of branding, mm -hmm. she had so many one-liners mm -hmm. powering through. Adversity mm -hmm. is not an option. Whatever yes. her, there were so many lines, I'm yeah. like, that's a great line, that's a great <laughs> yeah. line. Um, but her brand was right there. You know what, whatever you're gonna get, she's going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think she's going to run for office one day. I don't know why. Right, I just we'll feel vote it. together. <laughs> yes. Vote for Sophia. Okay, let us welcome Tanner. Just like that. Right. I have always been really good at catching reptiles. To this day, what I know best in this world are Puerto Rican lizards. As a biologist, I loved studying the way these populations would evolve through natural selection. The strong pass on their genes, and the weak, they don't make the cut. A few years ago, I left biology to pursue a career in business. In the business world, suddenly, I realized that I didn't make the cut. You see, in the world of elite corporations, masculinity still holds strong. And I'm not masculine enough. I like men. I'm not afraid to ask for help. I don't have big muscles, nor do I want them. Over time, I've realized that toxic masculinity is a lot like a species evolving through natural selection. It is desperate to survive and to maintain power. So it fears people like me, people who dilute it. It wants to cut us out. But guess what? I, I survived. A lizard, when it survives, passes on its genes into the gene pool. And likewise, I am going to pass this on into the world of elite corporations. Culture has told me how to be for far too long. But like the animals I studied for all those years, I'm gonna shed that skin. Here I am, world, bringing my full self. Now I wanna cry. That was so, so beautiful. Now I wanna cry. I know. <laughs> I'm mess. There's a moment when you see a thought leader yeah. born, mm -hmm. and that was it. Yeah. We just saw the birth of an amazing thought leader mm -hmm. whose brand is so clear and strong, mm -hmm. who's so powerful and moving that you just are astounded. Yeah. And the beauty of what he just said, 
it's bigger than this whole course. It's bigger than anything. Yeah. I just feel. It's, oh, it's, a, the, it's another politician. I'm sorry. I just, in a good way, I'm saying like, and, I, and when I use that word, I'm not necessarily saying politics. I'm talking about leadership, leading a tribe of people behind you, yeah. getting people so excited about your message that they want to follow and also spread your message. We talk about being the Pied Piper in, in class. Yes. And I'm seeing this time and time again tonight. And Tanner just brought me to tears with the leadership of the tribe that I feel is going to follow him. I just feel privileged yeah. that I was able to, to witness yeah. that. Okay, we can't take a cry break. We're gonna move <laughs> on. Deep breath, let us welcome Ray. Whatever my mood, there's an outfit to match. If I'm happy, it's bold prints. If I'm sad, it's black. And today, I'm feeling like a badass boss that's going to take over the world one Manolo at a time. <laughs> Fashion speaks volumes to me. It always has. It's art, it's communication, it's in a way our sense of identity. And yet, flipping through the glossy pages of Vogue, the flawless women, the beautiful photography, it can at times feel really inaccessible and intimidating. After Yale, I had the opportunity to work at Vogue as assistant to the editor-in-chief, Anna Winter. All of a sudden, the inaccessible became accessible. And before I knew it, I was sitting in meetings with Oscar de la Renta and advising Amal Clooney on her wedding dress. At Vogue, I learned that discipline is waking up at 5 a.m. every morning and working around the clock. I learned how to network and I learned how to work a room. But most importantly, I learned that first impressions matter. And if we don't learn to develop a distinct sense of style, then we can get left behind or even worse, forgotten. Since graduating from Stanford Business School, I've been imbued with this desire to leave my footprint on the fashion industry. I want to remove that impression that it's intimidating and prove to people that fashion doesn't have to just be for the fashionable. I believe that through a strategic sense of style, our voices, if anything, can be amplified. And my mission is to bring that microphone to women by helping them discover that sense of style. So let's make that first impression count. Look at wow. you, lady. <laughs> and she knows she did good too, how she's yeah. walking over there. That was powerful. That was just like dynamic, the energy, the, the confidence. I just, think? I feel like she is the new leader of this world. Like, I think Anna Winter bet, better be concerned. <laughs> Her assistant's going to take <laughs> Yeah, over. I think she's going to take over the world. But I think what she did is there's still that elegance yeah. and that kind of the fantasy, but she also brought it down to make it more approachable more to relatable. us. It's more relatable. More aspirational and relatable. She's yeah. me meshing the two. It's very much what yeah. you also are as well. Yeah, she's a lot more fashionable than me, but well, we know. <laughs> similar message, but she's a lot more fashionable but how than you, I am. How you approach people yes. is what I saw in Ray. Like, Ray looked so gorgeous yes. and perfect and stunning, and yet how she presented herself with her sense of humor yeah. and her joie de vivre, you just want to be her friend. That's the future of fashion leadership. That's what I feel. Yeah, you're right. You called that it. Do you think she'll give me that dress? No. No, I don't either. She might give you a job, but not a dress. Maybe. I'll take the job. <laughs> I'll take the job. All right, let's move on and welcome Joey. Oh, Joey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Joey Zoe, and I am passionate about healthcare. My story started five years ago when I met my girlfriend, Kate. Kate has cystic fibrosis. When she was born, the life expectancy for someone with this illness was 18 years. Today, it's 40. A year after we started dating, Kate was hospitalized because she was coughing up blood. As I sat with her in the emergency room, and later as I watched her juggle 20 different medications, five different pharmacies, and three different hospital networks, 
I realized the enormous challenge that she and millions of other Americans with chronic illnesses face. And I decided that my mission was going to be to transform the US healthcare system. I studied computer science at MIT. And I've worked as an IT consultant and as a product manager for HR software. I've spent 10 years understanding customers and building products to meet their needs. Now, I want to transition from a product manager in HR tech to a product leader who builds software that makes healthcare efficient and accessible to everyone. And there are so many opportunities from medical diagnostics to price transparency to prescription management. I want to revolutionize the system so that doctors can spend more time taking care of patients and patients can spend more time living their lives. Look oh at my God. That. that was so kick ass. That was so <laughs> kick ass. It was so tight. I'm, and again, and you're like, crying again. I, I can't, I'm, I don't know what's going on yeah. tonight. These students are bringing it. Yeah, they are. And they're excelling, but there's, it is so amazing how they're messaging. Mm -hmm. um, they're being their best selves. And I want to invest in every single one Me of them. Too. And I believe in them. And I know they believe in themselves. Yes. But you can, like, every origin story mm -hmm. that they're telling, I mean, it's really a love story that he's yes, telling between him story. and Kate. Yeah. And that was his driving force. And I know he's going to accomplish exactly mm -hmm. what he says. You know his brand. Because That's, there's a passion behind it personal yes. story, passion, he's sharing it. And by him sharing that, it allows other people to see, oh, wow, that's what you stand for? OK, well, come this way. Or there's so many different people that we could choose that stand for that. However, how you communicate that is that differentiator that's going to give him a leg up on people that have similar interests. That's exactly. Him yeah. besides someone else, I'm going with him. Mm -hmm. Because he's got the whole entire package, mm -hmm. plus the, com the way to communicate it. The way it. to communicate it, yep. Terrific. Let's move on and welcome Alana. Do you believe in magic <laughs> in a young girl's heart? How the music is free. Once upon a time, a young woman moved to New York City with big dreams of becoming a writer. Finally, she landed a job writing for a men's lifestyle website. Her dreams had come true. Or had they? Eager to understand her new audience, she soon discovered that she didn't have one. No one was reading what she wrote. Now, of course, I am this young woman, and this story represents a powerful insight into my passion for storytelling. I believe that content is communication and that it should reach as many people as possible. Because of this, I decided I was going to need to learn how to become both an artist and scientist in storytelling. This led me to a job at the Huffington Post where I was able to analyze stories with mass appeal. I steeped myself in the data and I innovated new content formats. I measured everything from page views to scroll depth to social shares. Finally, my work was generating tens of millions of views and shares online. Combining creativity with a keen analytical mind, I am both an artist and scientist in storytelling. I believe that the stories we tell each other matter, and be it a creator, a company, or a brand, my mission is to make these stories heard. Wow. She is so right on the mark oh my God. for where you need to be right now. Oh, yeah. Um, she's cornering the market in an area that is so important, like how to communicate and reach people. I actually didn't understand a lot of the ways mm -hmm. that she uses content. And I'm a content creator. Mm -hmm. You're a content creator. but you know, she was able to express her brand so beautifully. Oh, yeah. And her passion, I mean, storytelling has gone back to the shamans, mm -hmm. but she's bringing it into the modern mm -hmm. world and saying, I, can, I know how to adapt and I know how to conquer this new frontier. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of value in what she's talking about. And when she is needing to share that story with potential people that she is hiring mm -hmm. or, or teams that she is leading and she talks about the creative, but the science, I mean, yes. that is like, I just think of, I, I want to surround myself with people like that, right? Yeah. To crack the code and the algorithm and the words that search engine optimization and all of that. <laughs> but the creative too is a rarity. Yeah. And she showed that she is a gem. 
yeah. and that she's a diamond. She did exactly what you always say in our class. She really differentiated herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was so clear. Mm -hmm. And I loved her dress. Yeah, me too. And that sparkly belt. Yeah. Oh my God, we're at a break again. <laughs> okay, I don't want to stop. But we're going to take a short break. And when you come back, we're going we're to continue with Project U. Shane Cisneros is the Bay Area's leading fashion and visual brand stylist. With over 15 years experience, Shane's fashion credits include magazine covers to celebrity red carpet styling. Now focused on personal shopping and visual brand identity, let Shane take your look to a whole new level. Visit www.shanecisneros.com for more information. Project U would like to thank Brenda Hanbury Green for contributing to this program. Every day, Brenda works with gorgeous, professional women of all ages, shapes, sizes, and walks of life. Beautiful women. But we must be beautiful on the outside and inside. That is when we are truly powerful. That is when we do things we are meant to do on this earth. Brenda is here. Welcome back. I'm Allison Kluger, and I'm a lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Business, and I'm joined by my co-instructor, Tyra Banks. Yay! <laughs> Tyra and I created a course called Project U, which is extending and creating your personal brand. This is our third year, and we're so excited because this evening is kind of a capstone to our two-week course, where 25 students come and they present their personal brand pitch. And they have been doing so great. They've been doing so, so great. What are the elements that they need to show us? Um, storytelling, mm -hmm. um, vulnerability, um, goals, objectives. Yep. Yeah. And, and differentiating factors. Mm -hmm. What they have to do in a minute and a half is tell us what they believe in, what makes them special, how they're different from everybody else, and what they stand for in this world. We've been seeing some great students. So without further ado, let's welcome Malcolm. Malcolm. <laughs> oh, get yeah. it. Get it. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi. My name is Malcolm, and ever since I was a young child, I've been passionate about interior design. When I was five, on Sunday mornings before church, I would wake up early in the morning, excitedly turn on the television in my small one-bedroom home that I always shared with my mom and grandma, and watch all of the real estate listings that were happening that day in awe. When I was 12, I declared, I want to be an interior designer when I grow up. And I was heartbroken when I heard the reply, interior design is for women, choose something else. And so reluctantly, I did. After many years of hard work and dedication, I came to Stanford for medical school. And when it came time to choose a medical specialty, that passion I have for dermatology remained true. And I chose Dermatology because it dealt with the aesthetics. And this passion for aesthetics that I had also felt at odds with my modest upbringing. But then I questioned, why should great skincare be something that's only for people who have privilege? Surely everybody deserves to look their best. And I was inspired. I co-created a company designed to help people of color connect with dermatologists and plastic surgeons who would uniquely understand their beauty needs. Interior design is all about helping you feel comfortable in your home. Dermatology helps you feel comfortable in your own skin. And through my company, this feeling of comfort will be accessible to all people, no matter who they are or what their background looks like. From the exterior to the interior, 
From crafting spaces to crafting beauty, I want to bring you an experience that elevates you beyond the skin. Oh, oh mic oh. drop. And he did <laughs> drop the mic with that wink. Oh, oh. that was, that was, that was bananas. <laughs> that was like, so good. <laughs> from the sashing on, he looked unbelievable. Amazing. I want him to do everything on me right now. <laughs> I trust him with everything. He's going to make me look great exterior, interior. <laughs> yeah. His messaging, strong. Strong. Super strong. Powerful. The origin story, he's always been an artist. Yes. He's always looked for beauty and yes. aesthetics. But he's differentiated. Mm -hmm. He's found the niche that he needs. Mm -hmm. And I, I would trust him. I mean, Me uh, he's so credible. Me too. And yeah. he's so handsome yeah. and adorable. <laughs> Should we just go on and on? That was, I, I, you said it all. He blew me away. Yeah. He His really brand is so clear. So And clear. that's what I'm so proud mm -hmm. of him for. Because he's, he's authentically him. And in the sea of other people, he's yes. going to stand out. And I had a skin issue. I had some alopecia on the side of my head um, because I was working on a book. And it was so much stress that I lost like about a dime size uh, amount of hair. And I was in desperate search of an African-American dermatologist wow. that could deal with my hair because I did chemically straightening of my hair and they needed to kind of have an understanding of that. It was hard as hell to find. It took me like two months. So I would so use this, this, this product that he's creating, this service, yes. to be able to find doctors that can deal with my skin and, and, and my issues. That's it. He's going to find the people who it resonates with mm -hmm. and he's creating a service for the need. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Okay. Let us welcome Z. When I was young, my favorite uncle believed in tough love. He was five feet six inches, but he had this loud, booming voice that you could hear across the street. And he would use that voice to lecture me whenever I was too playful. But he was always the first to buy me something when I did well in school. And he bought me my first bicycle and taught me how to ride. Sadly, my uncle passed away when I was 12. I can still remember the sadness in my grandfather's eyes. This was the second time he had lost a son. Grandfather's grief led him to open up his home. He was not a wealthy man, but he touched the hearts of many with his warmth and generosity. My dining table always has room for one more, were his favorite words, as friends and neighbors often join our family meals. I have incredibly fond memories of my family gatherings, they were loud and chaotic, but I wouldn't want it in any other way. The whole family would be present with new faces that quickly evolved to become family. Grandfather taught me, through his actions, how to cherish people and build relationships. Despite the new family members, we still miss my uncle very much. Till this very day, my family still believes that he would have survived if the doctors had diagnosed his cancer earlier. His death drove me to search for better ways for us humans to make decisions. That search led me to specialize in machine learning and artificial intelligence. My journey led me to work with doctors to improve medical diagnosis for patients when I was living in Switzerland. Before Stanford, I was the head of, um, of a machine learning startup in Asia. I was the first man on the ground, I grew, and I grew the team to 20, and we signed millions worth of contracts. Just as how grandfather's dining table always had room for one more, I want to build businesses powered by AI that is inclusive and impactful at the same time. I have my AI expertise on one hand, my business acumen, and my ability to empathize with clients and adopt a human-centered approach towards solving their problems. My name is Zhi Hao. Reach out to me if you want to build a business in AI that is inclusive, impactful, and meaningful. Thank you. That was so good. It was amazing. She yeah, had that was so good. Wow. Wow. What's so incredible is that he had two kind of different brandings. First of all, as an, kind of an empathetic mm -hmm. human being who's going to bring that level mm -hmm. to whatever he does. And then this scientific ability with AI, with artificial intelligence. Yes. And so his branding is not only this brilliance, but the extra level. Yes. Which is that he's inclusive. Yep. 
there's room at my table. Mm -hmm. And it's driven by this, rem this memory of his uncle and his grandfather's words. Mm -hmm. You know how we say that you know, the people who invent the most important things in this world, they're trying to solve some sort of problem. Yep. I, I was touched by it because Ji Hao and I have talked about um, how helpful AI can be, but at the same time, so many people fear oh, of it. Such a good point. Yes. So what he did here, which I think is beautiful, is bought his family and love and, 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 and the passion and dedication to save lives and to use AI for that. And what that does is it creates this more of a friendlier love um, viewpoint when, when looking at AI, right, then, you know, from then the AI outside, is going to push humans away. Exactly. He's it's welcoming. actually saying it's going to bring life. I love to you, extend life. You always find, you find the nugget. Like, <laughs> you're right, because that's the differentiating factor. Yeah. And you always find that twist, Tyra. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're amazing. No, stop it. Yes, you are. <laughs> but he did a great job. Excellent. And job. I love that point. Um, all right, let us welcome Jackie. I can see but you when you I grew up in a family that talked openly about sex and pleasure. And as a result, I was able to help other people by creating an accepting environment to talk about these topics. But about two years ago, after a Harvard Law student sexually assaulted me, I had to relearn intimacy and trust and reclaim my own sexuality. I became very passionate about creating a culture where people, especially women, can experience intimacy not as a source of pain, victimization, or trauma, but of joy, connection, and empowerment. I'm now launching an organization to advocate for equal rules in business that treat women's sexual well-being as equally important to men's. Today, we see erectile dysfunction advertisements everywhere. But products that support women's sexual well-being, whether it be reducing pain, expanding education, or enhancing pleasure, are not allowed to advertise on the very same outlets, whether it be Facebook or the New York City subways. And this is just one of many double standards facing the women's sexual wellness products and industry. I want to change that to rewrite the rules in business and our society, to change our narratives of female sexuality to be about our joy, our agency, our desires, and our well-being. My name is Jackie Rotman, and I'm working to build a culture of intimacy justice. Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Thank, thank God for Jackie. <laughs> thank God for Jackie. That's all I can think of. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think there's just so much education in what she's saying yep. and so much, whoa, I did not know that. And I'm sure there's a lot of people watching now like, oh, my God, I had no idea yeah. that you can show an ad for this for a man and you can't do the exact same thing but for a woman. So just the education alone is amazing. I, I, what I love about Jackie is that there, there's a soft-spoken <laughs> feminine strength that I love. Um, and, and, and I want to listen to her and I lean in. And I can see a lot of people, um, her awakening a lot of people that weren't aware of this and then turning into her tribe of people that are following and spreading that message. She's absolutely a leader. Mm -hmm. And, and outside, you know, outside of this venue right tonight, she's a very soft, sweet, loving person. Mm -hmm. But in front of us, when she's talking about what matters to her, mm -hmm. you can see her strength, mm -hmm. her passion, and her determination yep. that she's going to change this world. Oh, yes, yeah, she is. And I think you're right. We talked about branding. A lot of it is education. There's, mm -hmm. there's got to be some element of, let me show you a new mm -hmm. way of looking at this yeah. world. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned so much every time she talks to mm -hmm. me. I'm so proud of her. And that was a really powerful I agree. branding pitch. Let's welcome next, Chaz. <laughs> Everybody loves compassionate people. And with so many problems in the world, it's easy to see why we need these selfless individuals to make the world a better place. But I think we need just a little bit of selfishness too. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I wouldn't be here today without the selflessness of countless individuals, especially my parents. I'll never forget when my mental health hit an all-time low and my mom dropped everything, flew across the country to be with me at school and make sure that I got the help I needed and the care that I deserved. But sometimes, being, doing good can be all-consuming. I've had the opportunity to work on several education reform projects over the last few years, trying to help young students have access to the same opportunities that took me to Harvard and Stanford and have let me travel the world. It feels narcissistic to say out loud, but if, if I can do something to make the world a better place, it feels like I should do that. I mean, there are so many people who have sacrificed to get me here right now. But that logic, it doesn't work for me. It's OK to be selfish sometimes. As much as we would like, most of us can't do everything all of the time. Caring about a cause, or your job, or even next quarter sales numbers, none of those things mean that you can't take care of yourself. There will be plenty of opportunities for early mornings or late nights. But to be ready for them, we have to think about ourselves too. I will be a compassionate leader, and I'm going to take care of myself so that I'm the best one that I can be. If that is not a speech for every leader in the world that does not have balance and does not take care of themselves and is only looking at winning, 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 I don't yeah. know what is. Yeah. yeah. That is. It's such a brave speech, too, because mm -hmm. I think there, I can't imagine anyone not relating to what he just said. Yeah because everybody is trying to be the fastest, mm -hmm. the best, the most successful at the detriment of mm -hmm. so many other things in their yeah. life that fall by the wayside. Yeah. This can even go for parenting, like <sighs> wanting to be like a super mom yeah. or a super dad and feeling like, oh, I have to do this, but not taking time for yourself to recharge yourself so that you can be even stronger for your children. You had a great example about um, when you're in a plane. Oh yeah, the oxygen mask, how they always say, yep. in, in case of a de depressurization or whatever, to put your oxygen mask on first yeah. before you put it on your child or the person that needs your help. Yeah, and you know what kind of leader he's going to be. He's mm -hmm. all about compassion, mm -hmm. but he's also about balance and recognizing that you need to take care of yourself mm -hmm. before you can impact the world. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Yeah. All right, let's move on and welcome Chaitra. I am a welcoming change, literally and figuratively. I'm Chaitra, and my name means a welcoming change. As my parents struggled to make their ends meet, they wanted my birth to signify a welcoming change, not only in our lives, but also in India, where everyone, regardless of their gender, socioeconomic status, and religion, would have equal opportunities. My high school and college had less than 10% female representation. But I drew inspiration from the meaning behind my name and went on to become the first female graduate in my family. Being the change I wanted to see, I rejected a better paying job offer from Goldman Sachs and went on to work with Unilever in rural India, where I could use business as a force for greater good. At the age of 23, I managed a team of 400 male workers and engineers, led the operations at a factory, and successfully transformed it into a top performing site. I believe that my passion to create value for the society would fuel my dream of becoming a C-suite executive in a Fortune 500 company. In this journey, I will be ferocious in my convictions and fearless in upholding my values. I will use my position to create greater access for women and to be a role model I never had. I am Chaitra Yatlagadda, and I will be a welcoming change for the generations to come. Nice. Oh, nice, Chaitra. When I see her, I think of poise yes. and elegance. She's kind of, she's a very small, delicate woman, and yet there's so much power. When mm -hmm. she said that she was in charge of 400 men. men. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, you know what, I can see that. Uh -huh. 
I can see it. Her brand is kind of, she is going to be a change maker. Mm -hmm. She's confident. She's going to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Absolutely. <laughs> and she can make people listen to her. Yes, yeah, she can. Um, she communicated beautiful. She looked beautiful yeah. too. She has the type of she, the the type of delivery that I feel is really good for um, for again, it's like a politics thing or or what do you call that when you're doing your address to your your company? Yeah, um, um, like a meeting, an annual no, meeting. There's a there's a thing like the Steve Jobs thing. What do you call that? Come on, people, help me out I here. No, it's the something address something. Anyway, oh, I know what you mean, you know what but I'm I can't think about. of it. I can't either. Shareholders meeting. Thank you yes, very much. God. Thank you very much. I was going to be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> I would have killed myself. <laughs> um, but yes, you know, like I just, there's something about her that I feel um, can speak to large crowds of people and can connect in a very, very strong way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and, and she just, she looked, she, I loved her visual branding as well. Um, I actually cannot read the teleprompter. <laughs> Sarah. You? All right. Let's welcome Sarah. When I was 11, my favorite place to play was in my mother's closet. One day, amidst the scars, and jewelry, and old family trinkets, I found what looked like a police badge with my mother's name on it. Now, I knew my mom to be many incredible things, but a police officer wasn't one of them. She told me it was from her time working as an assistant district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office. And then she started to tell me stories about her time there. She told me how much she loved her job, how she was one of the few women in her office, and how judges would insist she dressed a certain way anytime she argued in front of them. Always heels and skirts, never pants or boots. My 11-year-old self would listen to these stories and could only think how lucky I was to be born now instead of then. My mother grew up with black and white TV, typewriters, landlines. Surely her experiences had gone the same way as these prehistoric inventions. Mm -hmm. My first job out of college was working for a trendy startup in New York City. I was every stereotype of a freshly minted 22-year-old college grad. Ambitious, angsty, and uncertain of my place or voice. A few weeks in, I was wearing these fantastic red and blue checkered pants that I bought with my first paycheck. As I walked by one of my senior male coworkers, I heard, your ass looks great in those pants. Uh, thanks. That was it. I kept walking. It was a compliment, wasn't it? It wasn't. It was demeaning, distracting, and objectifying. It made me think that my worth at the company was tied not to the work I did, but how I looked. It has taken years and countless other incidents like that for me to finally find my voice, to proudly, on live TV, say what that 22-year-old couldn't. My name is Sarah Goodison. I'm a woman, a leader, an entrepreneur, a feminist. And if you tell me my ass looks great, you better be prepared to hear a lot more than thanks. Woo, girl, I love that. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a moment and I'm teary. Yeah. I got teary. I was kind of mesmerized. Yeah. Um, I, I could have listened even longer. She's an amazing storyteller. Her message is so strong. Mm -hmm. And um, I kept thinking, about how poised she is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. she, um, she has so much power. So much power. Yeah. And that last line, the reason why I went woo, is because <laughs> I imagined the guy that said that to her, seeing this, and his like reaction. Oh. Because she's a tiger. Yeah. You know, and she is going to get what she wants. And I love that she has the mother as that role model. Mm -hmm. And to me, she's continuing to pay it forward for future generations. So yeah. powerful, powerful, powerful. Yeah. And she's a very, she's, there's, there's such a femininity to her mm -hmm. and such a strength. Oh, yeah. And um, she's totally not defined by her, by her clothes mm -hmm. at all. But I loved how she was dressed as well. Mm -hmm. And I loved her hair back. Like, there was a lot going on in this presentation. Mm -hmm that she was delivering to us, but I, I know exactly what her brand is. Mm -hmm. I know that whatever arena she's in, she means business, Oh yeah. and she's not gonna tolerate anything, and she's so smart and she's a leader. She's gonna protect, protect that 22-year-old, yep. meaning her former self, as well as every woman that she encounters yeah. along the way. Really great. Yeah. Let us welcome Samantha. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So, how does a candid, creative, cool Stanford nerd with a spunky attitude change the world, you may ask? Well, by starting a talk show, of course. <laughs> But this just isn't any old talk show. This is the talk show that inspires entrepreneurial action. In every episode, I'm going to be building a business on the show. So not only will I be talking with entrepreneurs and experts, but you get a chance to see what it's like to watch a business built from the ground up. Now, I have to admit, I haven't always been the hostess with the mostess. I've come from a pretty humble beginnings. I it's your truth. It's your truth. Tell your story. In college, I spent some time uh, living out of the back seat of my car. Um, and I worked four and five jobs to get myself out of homelessness and to pay off over $70,000 in debt that I had amassed. Um, from there, I went on to work at places such as Google, IDEO, and an artificial intelligence startup in Mexico. I've traveled to Guatemala to work with women's rights activists, and I've mentored young girls of color in Oakland. I've even mentored startup founders who have gone on to win pitch competitions with money. I'm really proud of that, and not to mention I started my own company. So. To say the least, I've done quite a bit since sleeping in my car, but my mission has not stopped yet. The Samantha Ely Show is going to be a vessel for all of the entrepreneurial knowledge that I've amassed over time. So I'm really excited about the Samantha Ely Show and I hope you'll tune in. Wow. That was, it's very poignant because even though she took a break, mm -hmm. her, like you said, her truth came right out. Yeah, it's like, just tell your story. Yeah. Just talk. And you know what? It's almost a blessing that she had a little bit of a hiccup because she went from presenting to being. To being. So I, it's exactly <laughs> it. Right? Yes. Yeah. And it's so real. Mm -hmm. And that's her. That's her brand, too. And that's mm -hmm. what's going to make her a great talk show host. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want the presenter. Mm -mm. You want, it, I mean, it's funny. She couldn't have planned it better if she had planned I it. I know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because it was like this, and then she flipped it. Yeah. And then you're like all of a sudden raw. Yeah. We talked about that in class of when I told the world to kiss my fat ass. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I was called fat, and so I had a talk show, and I did this big monologue, and at the end said, kiss my fat ass, and I wanted to be so strong in the end, but I started to cry. And I thought it was a mistake. I thought that humanity was a mistake and I wanted to do it over and my director says do not do it over that was real and that was raw and we almost had that moment I feel like we just had that moment with Samantha yeah yeah well we're gonna have to let her know how great we thought she was yeah. and we just have to let you know how grateful we are to be presenting Project U to you to all of you out there Tyra it is such a genuine pleasure to I be sitting I love you oh. with you thank you so much for creating this class with me and I also want to thank KMVT v Station because you are all the best. They're We've, so good. Yeah. You guys are the best. We're so happy here. And we love you all. And thank you for welcoming us into your studio. And we're going to wrap it now and say thank you for a wonderful evening. Thank you, students. Thank Project you. Project you. And you guys work on your own personal brands. You've seen what the students have done. Like, what's your elevator pitch? What makes you different? What makes you special? Write it down. Hopefully you learned yeah. something tonight. And maybe we'll see you next year. Oh, yeah. Hope so. Year four. <laughs> Thanks so much.